Okay, so just to review what we covered at the neuromuscular junction, we had, we have a axon that's carrying a nerve impulse all the way to the end, and all the way at the end, we have an end bulb. And at the end bulb, or the synaptic end bulb, we have these synaptic vesicles that carry neurotransmitters, and at the neuromuscular junction, it's called acetylcholine. Now we have calcium that rushes into the synaptic end bulb, and it tells the acetylcholine to be released. So if we go to the picture on the lower left, we see that calcium is going to send a message telling acetylcholine through the method of exocytosis to open up, release that neurotransmitter into this synaptic cleft, this space right here. When the acetylcholine passes through the synaptic cleft, now it's going to bind to the motor end plate side, to the muscle side, and it's going to bind to these green structures. And those green structures are receptors, or they have receptors on them, but they are channels. Think of acetylcholine as the key. It's going to unlock that door, and when that door opens, it's a sodium channel. Sodium rushes in, creating excitation or an action potential. When that action potential, when the acetylcholine creates that excitation, it moves down the transverse tubule, butts up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which stores calcium. It's going to release calcium into the sarcomere. The sarcomere are the thin filaments, which is actin, and the thick filaments, which are myosin. Somehow that calcium is going to have an impact on that sarcomere, creating a contraction. And the term contraction means tension. So now what we're going to be covering is what exactly is happening with the calcium to make a muscle contract. So the contractile proteins are myosin and actin. And if we look on the bottom, this is actin. We'll put an A here for actin. And this one is myosin. We'll put an M for myosin. And myosin has something called myosin heads. And these myosin heads have to interact somehow with actin. And there is an actin binding site on the myosin head right there. And it somehow has to interact with the myosin binding site on actin. So they need to make, they need to connect. But what you're going to see on actin is you'll see that all of these little yellow circles Each of them has a little black dot on it. The black dot is actually the binding site. But the binding sites are not exposed, right? They are being covered. And there's something called tropomyosin, which is this string or this rope-like protein that's covering the binding site. And then there's troponin that acts as the staple or the glue that's holding tropomyosin in its place. And as long as you have troponin and tropomyosin in place, the binding sites are covered. So that means that myosin can never connect to actin to actually create a contraction. So troponin and tropomyosin, these are the regulatory proteins that act as the on and off switch. And what calcium does is calcium's role, I'll put a K here, the plus. So what calcium's role is, is calcium goes after troponin and removes it. And when troponin is removed and 
think of think of calcium as like the staple remover it's going to remove troponin so that the tropomyosin which is that string or that rope moves out of the way and when it dislocates or moves the binding sites are now exposed and when the binding sites are exposed myosin can attach to the actin and create a contraction that's what was happening here the thin filaments were actin and the thick filaments in the middle with these little heads these extensions that's myosin heads so the myosin heads are going to interact with actin due to this calcium release so calcium's role here at the sarcomere is that it goes after troponin okay and i'm going to go over that again with you the structural proteins like titan nebulin and alpha actin and myomesin and dystrophin these are structural proteins and they deal with the alignment of the muscles and the stabilization of them and extensibility and elasticity. And sometimes there are autoimmune conditions against these structural proteins. You've heard of muscular dystrophy. Well, dystrophin, muscular dystrophy is an autoimmune condition against these. So there's gonna be issues with stabilization and alignment and elasticity of those. The contractile proteins are actin and myosin. Actin is thin, myosin is thicker, and then the regulatory proteins are tropomyosin and troponin. The tropomyosin, remember, was that rope, right, that string, and then the tropomyosin were those, were the staples holding it in place. So now, here we have actin. These are, each of these are called G molecules. And when you have a bunch of G's, um, you get a what they call an F strand. But the point to this is you see all of these circles right here. These are the binding sites, and you can see that they're covered. They're not exposed yet. What's covering them is tropomyosin, and what's holding it in place is the troponin. So think of troponin as the staple. Tropomyosin is that rope, that protein. And then what does calcium do? Calcium comes in, goes after troponin, plucks it out, tropomyosin moves, and now these binding sites are exposed and myosin can attach to it. And these are the myosin heads. All of these are myosin heads. And those myosin heads are going to attach to those binding sites. So down here, you could see is the myosin head. And they have these little hinges. They have like two little hinges here. But these hinges move up and will attach to the active site or the binding site. So again, you have these G molecules, which are those spheres. And when they all connect, we get an F strand. You can see tropomyosin and troponin. Okay. Now, when the tropomyosin and troponin are removed, you end up getting a contraction, okay? You could see that here, the sarcomere at rest, you could see this H zone, this H zone is nice and open, but here the H zone is much shorter, which means a contraction took place, okay? So let's take a look at the sequence of events that take place. So on the left, we have the steps that initiate a contraction, and on the right, the steps that end it. So here's the somatic motor neuron. Here's the synaptic terminal. And at the very end is an N bulb. The N bulb is making contact with the N plate. So where they meet, that is the neuromuscular junction. The gap or be the space between the synaptic N bulb and the muscle is the synaptic cleft. So the red dots here are the vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We're gonna have calcium that's gonna rush in here. Calcium is gonna tell the neurotransmitter to release and it is released, exocytosis. And it's gonna to bind to a receptor, okay? 
Remember those receptors are sitting all along here and it's closed. That channel is closed. But when acetylcholine binds to it, the channel opens and sodium rushes in. When sodium rushes in, we get an action potential that goes down the T-tubule. The T-tubule makes contact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum holds calcium, so now the calcium is going to be released. The calcium is released, and it's going to work and act on the sarcomere. Sarcomere is made up of actin and myosin. When the calcium is released, the calcium goes after the troponin, pulls it out, tropomyosin shifts out of the way, and the binding sites are now exposed. So you have one hinge bends up, the other hinge bends, makes contact, and it creates what they call a cross bridge between actin and myosin. And then you get a contraction that takes place, and we can see the H zone gets smaller. Now, to end the contraction, we just have to remove the neurotransmitter. So acetylcholine is removed by acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. If you break down the acetylcholine, now there's no more messenger. There's no more excitation. We don't see any excitation. So what happens to all the calcium? It's recaptured. It goes back in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If there's no more calcium, troponin and the tropomyosin go back to their normal resting place. The contraction ends and you end up with relaxation. So to review those steps here, these are the steps that happened on the left side. And then these are the steps that happened on the right side. So at the neuromuscular junction, Acetylcholine is released at the synaptic end bulb, right? The acetylcholine is released. It goes in the synaptic cleft, and it's going to bind to the receptor. The receptor is that sodium channel. When it binds and the sodium channel opens, you get an action potential. You get excitation. It's going to spread all throughout the T-tubule. The T-tubule butts up against the sarcoplasmic reticulum that holds the calcium, so it's going to release the calcium. It's going to release it around the sarcomere. The calcium that was released is now going to attach to troponin and remove it, changing the orientation of the troponin to the tropomyosin. Now the binding sites are exposed and a cross bridge forms when the myosin head connects to the actin. And this contraction is going to take place over and over. And the only thing that's going to create, think of um, having a tug of war, right? When you're, both your hands are on the rope and you pull the rope towards you, one of your hands need to release to grab the rope in front of you to pull again. And then your hand has to release and then you grab the rope in front of you and pull again. The release of the myosin heads are powered by the breakdown of ATP. So in order to remove the myosin heads, you need energy in order to do that. To end the contraction, acetylcholine is broken down by acetylcholine esterase. Anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme. When you break down the acetylcholine, the sarcoplasmic reticulum reabsorbs the calcium. And if there's no more calcium, then there's nothing to affect the troponin tropomyosin complex, so it goes back to its resting state. Okay?